welcome back. I hope you're doing well. I've been very busy, haven't had time to publish a video lately, um, but there was something that I've been thinking about doing and that was reprocessing this image with the Cat's Eye Nebula. And I did reprocess it. I liked the results a little bit better than what I had before. Um, but there's some things about this image that I didn't I didn't like. It looks too artificial to me and I think it, it has something to do probably too with the quality of my data, um, the amount of exposure time I had. Uh, but I thought uh, I could maybe do a better job processing it now because I, I took this back in June, July of 2018. It's now October 2019. and. I feel that my processing skills have improved a little bit or somewhat so I wanted to see if I could do a better job with this and again it looks it looks artificial to me and I want to give it another attempt and you, I don't know if you can see it or not but I've got the red splotchy background here as well I didn't do a very good job getting rid of that so I want to give it another attempt I actually have the new image here but I want to show you the processing steps that I use and I've actually so I've actually already processed it but I'm going to share you the results uh, in a step-by-step -step fashion so like I said I took this in June or July 2018 it was with an edge uh, HD 8 inch you know, it was with my ZWO ASI 1600 monochrome. So I did the RGB and I also uh, did the HA. And I should have captured the oxygen. This is a strong oxygen target. Uh, I think that would have helped with the data. And I don't know why I didn't do it. I just may have been anxious to get it processed and I didn't take the time to go out and get the oxygen as well as I think what happened. And I unfortunately I have a hodgepodge of different exposure times and total exposures that I took for the different filters. You want to you want to be consistent, the same amount of total exposure time for your RGBs and uh, I was somewhat starting out here, but I didn't do a very good job in that regard. So it's 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 a real mess, but uh, I, I am going to do, or I did do, a photometric co color calibration with this new processing that I did. So I think that helped balance the colors. So, anyways, yeah. So I, I, it's been it's been more than a week, maybe two weeks, since I posted a video, and just life happens, and there's other things that are more important, uh, uh, other priorities rather than astrophotography. So. I'm going to show you what I've got here. I have this Cat's Eye Nebula folder. I have my Rev Dash that I did a year, a little more than a year ago. And I've got my Rev A, Rev a folder here. I've got my folders numbered, which helps keep it all organized in the order that I process the data. I've got my Super Bias here, my flats. And my flats weren't uh, captured correctly, so they don't really do a very good job when I apply them as we will see and I have my lights my calibrated lights my calibrated with cosmetic correction my registered results integrated and then all my combined results they're all here in this folder and the way I do it normally is I save each file after every step of the processing in case I ever want to go back and start somewhere here in the middle if, if for some reason I don't like a particular step or something I did then I don't have to go and redo it all again um, so after each step I'll save the file again and I'll add on additional text that's applicable to what I did and these down here these are my luminous masks range masks and I, I kinda I say here when I use them for deconvolution and for um, uh, MLT bias and HDR. I use this one for the noise reduction, etc. So that's how I do it. So I'm going to go and I'm just going to bring up this combined image. It's my RGB with my narrow band, and there it is right there. You can see uh, the problems with all the red and the green, and you can see my flats did a terrible job. Uh, I don't think I had the right right exposure time for my flats, but this is what we're going to start with here. And I've already, like I said, I've already processed all of this. I'm just going to show you these results step by step for each one of those files. And 
this is my uh, my desktop my process icons and it's really nice if uh, you get these set up the way you like in the order that you you do your uh, processing what you can do is you can just drag this triangle bring it over after you get this set up the way you like and then you can right click on this and set icon identifier and you can rename it this is something that you feel feel uh, makes sense and then you can go and order them so these are the order I process uh, my images in using PixInsight here and then you can go and you can select all of it right click and you can say save selected icons and I've got it right here I'm gonna save it and I think this is, this is kind of funny it says do you really know what you are doing and it's asking me if I really want to overwrite the current so anyways yes you know what I'm doing here okay so this was my narrow band RGB combination so we're here right here at this step here channel combination I did the RGB I combined the RGB the registered RGBs and calibrated RG, RGBs and then I use a script utilities narrow band RGB combination is what I use to combine it with the HA data it seems to do a pretty good job so this is what we have right here and then the next step, the next step I did was a dynamic background extraction. And this is, is a great tool. I love using this tool and there's all kinds of tutorials about using that. Uh, sometimes you can get away with just using the automatic background uh, extractor um, and sometimes not. Uh, it just depends. How, how much of a gradient you have with your with your color and how, how messy your background is so I can see this isn't fully uh, I've got still some some vignetting here in the corners a little bit still but this is uh, my DBE results I'm not sure why I, did. I didn't decide to still work on it a little bit more if I if I do DBE a little bit more you can get get rid of even this in these corners uh, but I know I'd eventually do get rid of them. So dynamic background extraction so it did a great job. Got rid of all this uh, this red and this green. Made it more uniform, dark and dead. You can still I still have these dust donuts. Unfortunately, if you can see those uh, dust donuts right in here 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 they're just all over the place so i wasn't i wasn't uh collecting my flats properly okay so i did that after the dbe i did a crop maybe i just cropped out the uh the corners let's see here so yeah it looks like that's what i did so you can see here again i'm going down this flow that i have and my dynamic crop is right there and so I, I applied it to that image got rid of the stuff I didn't want there's a little there was a little bit of field rotation if you remember in that last image um, so I had some gaps on the sides uh, it's a, and it's always really neat uh, when you see the image for the first time and you combine the data even if it looks cruddy starting out it's always a, a wonderful thing when you first see that because you spend all this time processing all this data and you finally get it all together and there it is there's that image that you worked so hard to obtain all the data for night after night and what's even nicer is when you process these images and you find um, other objects that appear that you weren't necessarily trying to capture this little galaxy up there up here and it's it's kind of a uh, strange isn't the word but it's, uh, it's a little uh, different I mean it's this galaxy it's an oval it's got this central cylinder here and I don't know if this is a star or if that's part of that galaxy itself but a, a neat little guy um, very symmetrical looking galaxy I think there's one down in here this little fuzzy right there that's always neat when you find other things uh, and capture other other objects so that was a dynamic crop still got all these dust donuts 
So what was the next thing I did? The next thing I did, I'm going to go up here, I did a photometric color calibration is what it's called. And with that, you don't need to give it a, a reference. Well, you select a reference. I'll show you here in a second. Color reference. So photometric color calibration. Um, so I don't know. I changed the color. Uh, background is a little bit darker and the uh, cat's eye it actually looks like it brought out a little more green um, so I don't know about that but I stuck with it I stuck with it um, because I I do think the background color looks better and I'm not an expert on photometric color calibration maybe you know more about it than I do maybe there's a Maybe there's a better tool I should have used. I don't know. That's that's what that's what I'm using right now for my color calibration to uh, get all those color histograms lined up properly. So what you do here, you just go search coordinates, and I think this is was NGC 6543. You type it in, and you hit search or enter key, finds the coordinates. You say get and it populates it with right ascension declination you say what do you want to use for your white, white reference to do your color calibration and i usually just stick with this first one here average spiral galaxy and you can go and do your apply it to it and you can do a background neutralization also as part of that so that's the result and you can see again i'm, I'm just slowly adding on to this file name uh, pcc for photometric color calibration. I'm checking this uh, my video encoder. It's been having some problems so I'm trying to find the right settings so my computer can keep up. Um, yeah something else I'm going to show you. I'll show you real quick here. Um, I was going to make another a video about this actually but uh, there's a tool you can use it's called uh, RAM Disk, and what you can do is you can use it to uh, create a, a, a disk from your RAM memory. And I did that, and what you can go is you can go up here and edit. Uh, maybe I will make another video later, but up here in Global Preferences, Directories and Network, and your Swap Storage Directory. So what you can do, this helps speed up processing the pics inside and it did make a difference for me and I created what I call the R drive and you can put it in here multiple times they recommend to have four to eight of these I believe so I've got a C drive temp folder and I've got this R in here four times you just go down here and apply and you can speed up your uh, processing time it did make a difference I don't uh, it wasn't I don't think it was a factor of two maybe 50% increase it's probably right around there I didn't measure it and there's a way you can you can measure it too with the script, which I haven't done. So that's my photometric color calibration. If you have any tips, if there's something you think I can be doing better in my processing, please let me know. Add step, take away step, do something differently. Again, I'm learning. I am not an expert. Okay, so then what I did, okay, so I've got all this, these background donuts and then and, using curves transformation to try to darken the background i found that i darkened the object too much um the cat's eye was a problem so what was i going to do I, I, and i figured out well i can use a range mask so what i did is i made a range mask for, for this image and i should have it right here range masks for SCNR, so here it is, a range mask for SCNR, and you have to, you have to uh, not only make it, but you have to uh, make it non-linear, so or, or else it won't work properly. So you have to use the screen transfer function and the histogram transfer function. I'm not going to show you did that. So, anyways, I made this range mask, and I tried to get the background dark I mean I got a lot of speckling here I cut a prime maybe change the settings a little bit got a little bit darker um, but the object and the stars are all white so I applied that range mask to this and I masked out all the good stuff the nebula the stars those little galaxies 
and I just hammered it with SCNR over and over. So this did have an effect in the background. So what I do, I have the amount all the way up to one. I would drag it over here and I would, I would apply it. And I would get rid of red, I'd apply it again to the next color, green, and then I'd do it to the blue. And I'd make sure I did all, all three of them the same amount of time. And you can see I got a really good result. I got rid of all that crud in the background from those dust donuts that my flats didn't get rid of. Um, because what I had before again was this. I don't know, maybe you can't see this watching this. But I had all these dust donuts in here, this big mess. And there's also, it's, the background is a little green still. And after I hammered it over and over with the SCNR in the background, nice and clean, no more dust donuts, it looks great. So that technique worked, and I had not done that before. I tried to do a curve transformation. It was very difficult. So, yeah, so that worked out well. Uh, so after I did the SCNR of the background, then I did the multi-scale linear transform to get rid of the noise. And I did that with a luminance mask. So you gotta be careful when you do it. Uh, what I find is the first layer, I'm gonna bring up multi scaling and transfer and make sure my stream is still working. It's still working great. So, what I do is I normally do these one at a time. So, I'll just say what I do is disable these. Disable these, I do them one at a time, and I'll kind of zoom in on the image. You can do it with the preview too, if you have a slow computer to see what type of results you'll get. But I normally zoom in and I apply one of these at a time. I do it as many iterations as I think I need. Uh, but the first layer, I can normally apply that without a mask because you, you have that uh, high resolution noise it's over the whole image, it's even over the objects um, that that you want to keep. So sometimes I'll apply that without the mask and clean up even the nebula or the stars themselves. And then I'll, move, I'll disable this one, I'll move to the next one, noise reduction, and I'll apply it, same thing, until I get through all of them. And it might not look very different to you but I did get rid of a lot of the noise in the background so that was that my luminance mask um, deconvolution I did a deconvolution and deconvolution is the hardest thing I think processing with pixels and so you gotta get it set up exactly right or you get artifacts and it can just uh, be very frustrating and I'm actually I don't use it as much anymore. I'm actually using the MLT, multi-layer uh, transform, multi-scale linear transform with a bias applied. Um, but I'm sure it doesn't look different to you. But but I did um, I did sharpen it up and get those uh, the crisper results, uh, the higher resolution, um, and it does the object does look better because I did that. But when you do the deconvolution, you need to go through all these steps here. Um, you have to uh, create a, a PSF point spread function I believe is what that stands for from uh, your, your stars and the star mask, luminance mask, range, well, not the range mask and you, you put those parameters all in here, use them all here in these menus, de-ringing, de-ringing mask and you have to these global darks and global brights, you gotta get those set up correctly or you get ringing artifacts. Again, it's really hard. Uh, at least it has been for me. And I've watched videos, looked online. Again, I think it's the hardest thing to do in Pix Insight. So that was after deconvolution. Bring out some of the details, what it does. And then I did uh, this, I used the other technique in addition which is the MLT, multi-scale linear transform, the bias. And 
I even improved it a little bit more, and you can't see it. Uh, no, I, can, I can zoom in here. You know, some of this is limited to quality of my data. I, I mean, I've got other noise artifacts out here still, so perhaps it could be processed even a little bit better. Um, but more, uh, more detail after the MLT bias, and what it is is it's an MLT bias. Um, I think I, the recommend, recommendation is that you do that in a nonlinear state. So after my deconvolution, uh, did I do that in? No, I did it before. I'm sorry. So I did. I did deconvolution. I did MLT bias before I made it nonlinear, and and I think it did improve it uh, a little bit. So what you do here is this bias you want set to zero when you're doing noise reduction but when you want to sharpen it sharpen the detail you can change this bias to like 0.1 and then you apply it just like you do in noise reduction and it'll sharpen up the details and this is the high frequency layer one and and as you go to four you'll get to more of the lower frequency artifacts okay so then this isn't going to look any different, but then I did a histogram transformation. I made it nonlinear, and that's pretty easy to do. And here it pops up. So what you do is you can see down here. This is when I do my nonlinear transformation. I got a screen transfer function right here. You go and you track the current image by hitting this check this uh, check mark. And you bring up histogram transformation and grab this and bring it down here to the bottom bar and it changes this histogram curve you reset this and then you go and you drag this over here like this and then it applies it it makes it nonlinear, and it's now nonlinear. and then you save it and that was really fast you know I, I saw somebody do this for the first time when I was learning how to use this and I was like, what did he just do? And I had to watch it over again. And then the more you use PixInsight, the faster you can do all these things. And PixInsight has a very steep learning curve. Uh, it was very intimidating when I first started out. Very, very you know, frustrating for me. Um, but you know, you gotta be patient about it. Eventually you'll get better and better. You'll learn the tools and your processing time will get faster and faster. But it is a steep learning curve, and it's not, for some people, I think it's not very intuitive. It depends on the type of, I think, person you are. Um, you know, if you've got, uh, if, it, just, it just depends. Um, I'm an engineer, so I kind of understand some of these terms. Um, but, you know, any, anybody can learn this. You don't have to be an engineer. Um, but to me, it's very like it's mathematical, right? You're using all these mathematical tools. Photoshop, um, you know, the menus aren't as detailed. I don't think. I, you know, I could be wrong about that. But a lot of the stuff is going on behind the scenes. And here you got pixel math you can use. It's you know, it's a super powerful tool. Super powerful tool, and I just love it now. But there is a steep learning curve. Um, so I think some people like it and some people don't, but I think the majority of people like it. So I'm going to close that. And what's the next thing I did? So we did the Dinky convolution, MLT bias, histogram transformation. Then I did a curve transformation with a luminance mask. So um, and I could have done this without a luminance mask. But I did it with the luminance mask to try to protect the target while I was able to bark, uh, darken the background. You can see, so this this worked out really well. Um, sometimes I use curve transformation without a mask, and it just darkens the object too much. I, this time I decided, well, I'm going to try putting a mask on what I care about and use curve transformation. Um, and I think it worked out for me. So. There's that, and there's that. So I darken the background considerably, and the central nebula, I did not affect it at all. I didn't touch it. It looks pretty good. 
Actually, I mean, I actually I brightened it you know, a little bit because of this, this central bright um, portion of the cat's eye, it even got brighter. And that's kind of a problem because there's information in there, which I do try to bring out later. But it actually, this bright spot got whiter, which, uh, which to me... It wasn't ideal, but it, it was what it was. Maybe I, I don't know. Maybe I should be more careful about that. But we're gonna try to recover that information that's buried deep inside that white dot there in the middle, because there is information. Uh, okay, so that was curve transformation CT with luminance mask. Okay, so then I did this HDR. Uh, HDR process what that does is it will eliminate that saturation there in the middle and there, there's this there's detail there that's buried unfortunately I think it did darken the object in general a little bit um, so I so this is, might not be quite right it's, I may have, may have uh, Overcorrected because I've got this circle still, and I don't think that's right. Um, I made it a little too bright, and with the HDR, then it kind of made that I got this circle residue left over. Um, I, but I left, but I was, uh, well, I just left it as it was. Um, so, anyways, if I zoom in here, there, there was that br that bright white circle, and look. Now I got this cat's eye here. I, I think this is why they must call it the cat's eye because of this uh, central eye that looks like they have the, the pupil of a cat. Um, but you know, you see a lot of pictures with the Hubble Space Telescope. It'll just show this portion here. You got this little triangle on the top, oval triangle at the bottom. So there's. It's amazing how PixInsight could just look at that oversaturated area there in the middle and look at the, the levels which you can't really it's hard to see with your, your eye that's so bright but it looks at it must look at the relative levels and it's able to um, dig out that detail there in the middle so that's pretty cool but I, but I don't know I still have this circle and that doesn't look quite right but I went with it Maybe I'll, I'll try to reprocess this again a year from now, and maybe I can do even a better job. Okay, so that was with that was with this HDR tool, multi-scale transform, very easy to use. And then I did this this morph transformation, and what I did. Some of you may not do this, but sometimes I think the stars can be a little too much and oversaturated um, I don't know maybe I, I used it a little too much here but I do I bring out the color later um, and they can they can take away from the target I think so I like to uh, what I've been doing lately is making my star smaller and yeah so that's uh, I like it I like having the stars smaller and they're not too distracting from the main object a morphological transformation is what that's called and it erodes the star and you can do as many times as you want you can if you do it over and over and over and over again you'll get to a point where you just don't have stars anymore I suppose so I did that uh, made the star smaller then I did a curve uh, transformation for saturation I wanted to bring out the color uh, a little bit more color, color in the stars, color in the nebula, and this is just a matter of taste, I think. Uh, but I've got a lot more color here in the nebula now, and I've got a lot more color in the stars. You can start seeing orange, yellows, and reds, and blues, and to me it just makes for a more interesting picture. Yeah, so... Yeah, so I'm getting close here. Is there anything else I did? That was really the last step, the curve transformation. And you do that with this curve transformation tool. So it's the last step in my flow. You click on the S, 
And you just go and you kind of move this up like this and I try to get it symmetrical here under these rectangles like in the middle there or whatever. I'll bring it up. I'm going to bring it that high. I, I usually I'm in this region here as I move this curve. Uh, I think that's all I did in PixInsight because I had my XISF file and then I saved it also as a JPEG in PixInsight and then I brought it into just a Microsoft photo editor and I do some little bit of touch up, additional touch up and that's this Rev A version here. And once I had that Rev A, I loaded it to AstroBen. That's what I had before. Um, I, you can see I didn't use that HDR tool at all last time I did this. I don't know, maybe you like the first one better, but this was my new one. I think it's better. I, this is circle here in the middle bugs me. I don't think that's right. I think that's artificial. Um, but I like the new one better, personally. And you can see the eye now in the middle. There's a little bit more color that I brought out. Uh, so yeah, so that's uh, that's how I process. That's how I process this cat eye. And you can also just have a note when you use that HDR transform, you got to be careful. Sometimes you might want to use a star mask because you can affect your stars too much. And see, I got a little dot there in the middle of that star, which isn't right. Um, maybe I should have used a mask when I did that. I've got some green going on here too. You know, maybe I need to do an SCNR and get rid of that green. I don't know if that's real or not. That green there in the middle. And that's basically it. That's my reprocessing of the Cat's Eye Nebula for what it's worth. I have a lot to learn. I am my, by means no expert, but uh, I hope to learn more in the future and produce even better photos. So I hope you're doing well. I hope that was helpful. Have a good uh, rest of the weekend and have a good week. Thank you for your time.